Welcome to Module A. This has to do with decision trees and perfect information and expected monetary value. So we're going to look at creating a decision tree. We're going to build a decision table, which is slightly different. And I'll show you the Excel software on the decision table. I have found in the past that showing the software on the decision tree is actually makes the situation worse. It is clunky. It doesn't and kind of complex and it's easier just to uh, do it by hand in this particular case because they're one-offs so, so i'm not going to show you decision tree if you want to learn how to do use the software you're on your own for that but i will show you a decision table we're going to explain where we use decision trees and decisions tables and we're going to calculate expected monetary value expected value of perfect information and we're going to talk about the nodes in the decision trees and make decisions. So you need to, uh, through the process, clearly define the problems, identify the measurable objectives, develop the model, which has to do with the probabilities and the weight of each of the probabilities, come up with alternatives, such as build large plant, medium plant, small plant, or do nothing. Select the best alternative based on the results. You have to be careful. Are the, are the numbers presented to you in dollars? If so, are they profit dollars? Are they revenue dollars or are they costs? So it depends whether you want to maximize or minimize. For profit and revenue, you will want to maximize. And for costs, you will want to minimize. And of course, setting up the decision tree or the the decision table within the time frame that you have. Alternative. Alternative is strategy. So the alternative would be large, medium, or small. The state of nature is the item that you have control over. So for example, one of the examples we're going to do is you're going to have a inventory for different size crowds that attend a different event. You do not have control or very much control over the size of the crowd. What you do have control over is the size of the inventory. In the example you're going to see me present in Excel, you're going to have large, medium, and small levels of inventory. So Then the, the square or box is where it's a, it's an alternative, and the circle is a state of nature. The states of nature will have probabilities. The alternatives will not, so the box will not have a, a probability. It'll be choose large, medium, or small. So you have uncertainty. So in almost everything you have, that leads to risk. So you have uncertainty. If I bring in a large amount of inventory and I have a small uh, number of people attend the event, then I have risk with that. I don't know for a fact what size the crowd will be, how many people will, will be at the event, especially if it's something that there's a lot of walk-up sales for, like say a baseball game where, uh, depending on the weather, will affect how many people are there. Even for a hockey game, even if it's, quote, sold out, if it's a really brutally cold winter night, fewer people will actually physically go to the game. They'll just stay home and watch it on TV. So that's uh, where you have the risk. It's because of the uncertainty. And very rarely will you make a decision that is certain. So in other words, it's 100%. You'll remember that from statistics class, almost nothing in life is guaranteed or is 100%. MaxiMax simply tells you to find the highest possible gain, point number three. MaxiMin, least possible loss, point number three. Equally likely, 50-50. So that means, and we're going to deal with ones that are not equally likely. So you're going to have 40, 60, 50, 30, 20, if there's three alternatives. 
So here's just an example. We'll go through some specific ones from your book. So you can see the maxi max is the largest number. The and the maxi min is the do nothing. I mean, why would you deliberately lose money? So it's the maximum min number. So the min number is negative 180,000 minus 20,000 and zero. So maxi min. Equally likely, show you the calculations on that, you would pick the 40,000. Here's, uh, I've already talked about the risk and the risk levels will need to be total to be one. So you have 70, 30, you know, 10, 90, whatever. And so you simply take the payoff and you multiply it by the probability. You've actually done this many, many times in your life. So expected monetary value of alternative A1, construct a large plant, is 50-50, so it's equally likely. So 50% of 120,000 and 50% of a loss of 180 will give you a total of 10. Expected monetary value of A2, you can see the math, 50-50, then total it together, and you have 40,000. And expected monetary value of doing nothing is zero. So what should you pick? The best alternative is construct a small plant, which is A2. Best option. Because these are profit dollars or revenue dollars. It doesn't say clearly in the question, but they're not costs. The reason you can tell they're not costs is if they were costs, it'd either be all positive or all negative numbers. You have some positive numbers and some negative numbers. So in fact, I'll, I'll actually modify my earlier comment. They're profit dollars. Revenue has to be all in the same, like positive. Costs can sometimes are written as negative and they're sometimes just written. They're all costs. You tend to skip the minus sign at times, but the only one that could be a, a positive and a negative is profit. So this is $40,000 profit. Perfect information. So trying to remove the uncertainty. So here's the formula. The software will calculate this for you. So expected value with perfect information. And then there's perfect expected value of perfect information. So we'll go through both. So you do the multiplication. If you knew for a fact, an absolute fact, that the state of nature was going to be favorable. Then you would do this. Expected value with perfect information would be 100,000. So you take the 100,000, subtract the number you came up with before, and the software will do this for you. Is So you take the expected value with perfect information. That's if you could predict the future 100%. You knew that the crowd was going to be large. You knew for a fact the crowd was going to be small, which is almost impossible. But if you have perfect information, that you would have a $100,000 profit. Because of the uncertainty, you only have a $40,000 profit. So there's expected value of perfect information is 60000 So if I came along to you and I said, rather than you being unsure which alternative is the best, I could tell you which one will be the best and I'm going to charge you $10,000. Would you pay me for that? Yes, because you're going to gain 60, and you'd pay me 10, and you gain 50, if that makes any sense. So the, it's also in industry, it's the value of collecting additional information. So where do we stop? You Very rarely will you actually have perfect information. When you make decisions in life, you're going to find, and you probably already have, that very rarely do you have all of the information and you don't know what's coming next. That's what I refer to as it seemed like a good idea at the time. It seemed like this was the right choice, but then something happens later on that may change that. You didn't know, for example, if you were going to school and you didn't factor in some costs and things along that line and you didn't realize that there was a lot of extra costs of transportation and parking and some of the things you may not have thought about as much. So decision trees, here's an example. You can do this in the software if you want. 
It is a bit uh, cumbersome to do it. It's the only software that I could use that I don't show because uh, the reason why is I've, sh I've shown students how to use it in the past. They have a really hard time with it. It takes them longer than doing it by hand. And they either tend to get 100% or zero. They don't tend to get part marks. So I suggest you just kind of do it by hand. None of the decision trees are going to be particularly large. And you're going to have examples of those uh, when you do your, your tests. All right. So again, here's the decision tree uh, steps. I'm not going to go through each one in detail. Uh, you know, defining the problem, coming up with the structure of the tree, assigning the probabilities. We talked about this before, the payoffs, etc. And that's the end of Module A. Thank you for listening.